All right, we're back for part two, which is going to be a huge disappointment because I broke it. I did, in fact, break it. I didn't not break it. It's broken now. It's perhaps not fair to say that it's broken. It powers on. Images come out, but it's not useful for its intended purpose anymore. I'm not sure exactly what happened. Uh, I did have it open a couple times. I twisted a couple knobs, but not enough to cause what's going on now. And I'll show you, but the thing it's doing doesn't look like anything I did. I think it's just that this thing has not been turned on in probably 10 years, and when I started using it, it started taxing old, sad, tired components, and those components gave up the ghost after, you know, the fifth or sixth power on. It just stresses them when all that power rushes into the caps and the thing heats up, and, you know, it was probably inevitable. It's not a complete disappointment. I am still going to show you footage, because fortunately I was able to capture some before this thing started doing what it's doing, so I'll run that in a bit. But first I want to show you some functionality of the camera that I can't show you in the clips I recorded very easily, and which won't be too terribly disturbed by the problems that it's having with the image. So let me show you what the image looks like right now. So... You can imagine that my room is probably not this color. In fact, it, uh, yeah, this is what everything looks like now. Let me turn off the amplifier and you can see it's a little more like that. And yeah, that's not so bad, right? But it's still pretty messed up. It's mostly just this horrible greenish tint to everything. And it's not that the, it's not that the red channel is dead. I've tested it pretty thoroughly. I've been into the guts on this thing quite a few times. There's still a red channel. You know, you can barely see it, but it is there. And suffice to say, if I get in here and mess with some knobs, I can make that red channel come out. And, and the blue channel obviously is working, and the green channel obviously is working. We can also make a little bit of improvement by actually doing the white balance adjustment. See, it gets a little better, and that's almost natural color. It's close. Um, but unfortunately, after a while, it's going to start fading. Uh, it'll turn to a really deep miserable green uh, or blue and then it'll start flickering and it just gets worse and worse. So this is the best picture I can get out of it right now and I realize this looks all you know kind of all right um, but I'll point out a few things. One you see the the color fringing on the top of my fingers right uh right here that shouldn't be going on um, and uh, obviously everything is still quite green but more importantly it is going to start fading in a bit and then it won't be useful for anything. And just to demonstrate that there's nothing wrong with the capture interface, there's the bars. They look perfect. It's outputting clean video. The NTSC color encoder is working. It's just, uh, you know, it's it's not happy anymore. I've been in there and adjusted it a couple times, and, like, I'll get it pretty close, and then I'll be thinking, oh, that's great, and I'll look away and look back, and there's just like, this horrible blue cast all over the screen. I have this video clip from earlier of these weird pulsating green flickers that were happening, and as the thing runs longer and longer, that just gets worse and worse which to me says overheating, slowly failing component. So putting that to one side, it's not really that important that I get this thing to work because the stuff I want to show you on it, the functional stuff, I can show you by other means. See, the trouble is I'm kind of in the position of the kid who's whining to mom, mom, let's go to McDonald's, and she's saying, but honey, you have two perfectly good JVC camcorders in the fridge at home. I have other specimens of this class of equipment, and most of the features that are on the big red JVC, I can show you on these big black JVCs as well. ENG cameras share a lot of features in between eras and models. So even though these ones are much newer, this one's from like 1997, this one's from like 2002, I can still show you pretty much everything that the red one does and more, except these ones actually have pictures that work. In fact, pretty much everything on these ones is working. So I'll do videos on these at some point and I'll get to show you a lot of features of ENG cameras that I like. But what they don't have, something that's on that camera, but is on neither of these, is the lens. These both have quite good lenses, but there's a feature that the lens on the red one has that these ones don't, and I really wanted to show it to you, because it's the most kooky thing I've ever seen. I'll tell you, ironically, I'm looking at the picture from this, and this time around, it's not doing the weird bouncing, glitching thing, and the color seems stable, so it would be just my luck that this thing just fixes itself while I'm talking about it. But anyway, while it's working, let's go ahead and get on with the demonstration. For this demonstration, we'll go ahead and move this guy as far back as we can. We'll put this guy all the way over here. All right, let's get zooming. So as we zoom in here, this looks pretty clear. We might need to adjust focus at the far end here. I'm not sure why it's hazy. It might have something to do with whatever's going on with the video tube circuitry. But anyway, you can see now that we're in as tight as we can get and uh, we're focused. But suppose we want to get in tighter. Suppose this isn't quite enough zoom. 
what we can do is we can reach down and flip this lever here. See this lever right here? Watch what happens when we flip it. Now we're much closer. Now obviously that got a lot dimmer when we did that, but this camera has an image amplifier, so I'll just go ahead and flip that. And now we're back in action. It's probably obvious to a lot of you what this thing does, but for anyone who hasn't figured it out, this is a 2x multiplier that stacks on top of the lens's original magnification. But unlike a zoom, this does it all in one go. There's 1x, there's 2x. 1x, 2x. And it's not just at the far end of the zoom range either. We can zoom out and it still applies a flat 2x multiplier. Now you've probably figured out what this is doing. I think it's pretty obvious, but if you haven't, this is literally introducing a new set of lens elements into the image path in the lens, which is a thing I've never seen in any photographic lens in my entire life. See, that's why you've got this bulge here, because inside there's a turret that's got a set of elements on it that swing into the image path. If we take the lens off here, on the bottom here you can see there is this very small access hatch. Oops. So right there, is the mechanism. It's gonna be a little hard to see what it's doing. Let me try and get you an angle here. There it is. That's the extra set of elements that it's shoving into the optical path. It's a little cylinder in there that's got, I don't know how many lens elements. I'm not taking it apart. Probably ruin it if I do. One thing I'm actually curious about, if you look, this lever operates this roller here, which then operates the middle roller. That middle roller is actually attached to the lens group, so that's what swings it in and out of place. So then what's this one over here? I'm not really sure. It does have the spring on it, because there is a, a spring detent, so maybe that's just the spring detent, but it's also possible that it's uh, part of the electrical signal will tell the camera that you've uh, changed uh, magnification ratios. I think I might have seen that some cameras are aware of that, but again, I'm not taking it apart to find out, because I'll probably ruin it, and this is a nice lens. Let's just put this back on before I do any damage. In researching this, I learned that this is called a doubler, and I saw some people on a forum saying that a lot of really decent lenses will have doublers on them. Now, I mentioned earlier it got dimmer when I switched from low to high magnification. That's because the way the doubler works is it magnifies the image by two, thus increasing the image circle size. What that means is it's taking the image and it's spreading the same amount of light over a larger area. Now, most of that light gets lost because it falls off the edges of the sensor. So the part that's left in the middle that actually still hits the camera sensor is an expanded part of the image, but it's also only half as much light, so it looks much dimmer. I also mentioned I had to turn on the amplifier. I'll show you that as well. I'll go ahead and close down the aperture so that we don't get very much light from this scene. And there's this switch here that says high sense. When I flip the switch to the middle, it amplifies the signal coming out of the sensor by nine decibels. This is an analog amplification, not a digital one. So it has all the implications that that carries, specifically that it's going to get noisy. If we push it further to 18, it's going to get even brighter, and you can see now at this point the image does not quite look right. It might not be clear in the capture, but the image is uh, quite a bit noisier, and obviously the color has stopped looking quite the way it should. Now, this horrible blue cast is the one I mentioned earlier. Even in normal amplification mode, if I leave this thing running long enough, this horrible blue cast will come back. But that's because it's always there, and when I put it in high amplification mode, it just exacerbates it, so you can see that the blue channel is really running a lot hotter than it should be. Both these features exist, as far as I can tell, not because they're ordinary ways to use the camera. You wouldn't want to always run the camera using the doubler. You'd want to put a longer lens on it. The doubler loses light, and the doubler is lower quality. You can't just introduce a new group of elements into a lens on the fly. If the lens worked without them, it's not going to work as well with them. Optical formulas are extremely complicated. So if that's the case, then why would you have this? And if the high sensitivity switch introduces noise, why would you have that? And the answer, as far as I know, is that this is a device for emergencies, for situations where you don't know what's going to happen. This is a device you carry out on a rainy night to see a car crash. And maybe when you get there, all the street lights are out. You weren't ready for that, but you can't just leave. You won't get the shot. You won't get the scoop. You won't be able to run this on the news. You got to get something. It doesn't matter if it looks bad. So if you can't get close enough, you hit the doubler and you deal with the consequences. If it's not bright enough, you hit the intensifier and you deal with the consequences. This feature, the high sense one, I found on every single EMG camera I've looked at and on others, it's actually gone even harder. When I show you the newest JVC I have, there's a really neat version of it. I'll get to show you then. So that's all I could show you with this guy today. 
And I'll go ahead and roll some footage after this uh, that shows what it looks like when it's actually working, um, or at least when it was working as well as it ever was. I was still getting like weird color casts and stuff with it, but you know, it still can do better than I've shown you. Now the videos I'm going to show you here are not the best that this thing can do because my capture rig is ridiculous. See, since this outputs composite video and I don't have a videotape recorder to carry around with me, I had to come up with some way to record this thing in a portable fashion while I was out just walking around. So this is the solution. This is a camera hot shoe mount uh, with a ball head on it and this is a cell phone holder. We'll just, we just slot this on here. For the video output, we're going to plug in a RCA to VNC adapter. Plug the video in here. That video runs around here to an easy cap, which is a cheap $10 video capture card I got off eBay. Then the holder here, we're just going to put my Nexus 6P. Plug in this USB on the go adapter. And then we'll launch the Chinese malware app I got that lets me capture video. And there you have it. That's the image. And then I can just hit record here. And I'll get a recording. But it's not a very good one. So I don't feel the video from this really represents the quality of this thing. If I'd been able to capture it over my X capture, uh, I probably would have gotten a better picture, but this is all I could get out into the field, so such is life. I shot this video in a Fry's parking lot out of the back of my car while I was testing the USB adapter I just bought. The color's off because the white balance hasn't been set yet. I'll adjust that later and it'll look a lot less like Vaporwave. Here comes the white balance correction. You can see it looks pretty much like real life now. As I said, the camera looked a lot better before the components started going bad. Next I went to the park across the water from the Renton Airport. I always go there when I'm testing cameras because it's got a very clear view of the lake. That means I'm able to shoot video of boats and planes and that sort of thing. It's a pretty dynamic environment. Once again, I'll set the white balance, and this time when it comes out, it looks actually really good. There we go. That looks fantastic. And now we're setting the black levels. I don't fully understand what that does, but it seems to make the picture look better. Now I should note before we continue, do you see this green line at the top that fades to black? That was there ever since the first time I powered the thing on. It was the first indication that something inside of it was going bad. None of the adjustments I made to it were able to get rid of it, so I think that was a capacitor or some component in there that was going bad. That's the first thing that tipped me off. This thing wasn't long for this world. The first thing I did was just try the zoom out, and as you can see, even focusing by hand, the zoom on this thing is excellent. Really fantastic range, and everything looks crisp and saturated at a distance. One of my favorite things to do out here is to zoom in on the planes. Since these lenses have such absurd focal lengths, I'm able to get in there and get pretty good detail on them. I'm still hand-holding because I haven't gotten a tripod or a monopod yet. There's a demo of the doubler. You can see it drops the image quality pretty considerably. It causes a lot of flare, chromatic aberration. The whole thing got a little bit blurrier as well, but... You know, you can see I got the shot, and if I hadn't used the doubler, I wouldn't have gotten the shot. Now, mind you, I don't have a tripod or any kind of stabilizing equipment, but I'm able to follow this squirrel pretty reasonably because this thing is so big and heavy that it acts as its own sort of, you know, counterweight, counterbalance. So as I'm swinging it around, it's damping it quite a bit more than if I were using a handheld camera. Considering this thing predates optical image stabilization, that's pretty much a necessity. I suspect they could have made cameras of this sort smaller, but doing so would have sacrificed a lot of handhold ability. Here I'm going to demonstrate the doubler moving in slow motion. You see as it swings in and out it causes some pretty odd things to happen to the optics. That's of course because it's introducing you know, completely new refractive elements. You can also tell again that things get considerably dimmer, but the iris auto adjusts so it sort of compensates for that. I'll admit every time I test a really good lens I go to the forest and I look at moss. There's moss all over this state, and I just think it renders really well on camera. This isn't even the best shot I've got of it. You can also see here how thin the depth of field is. I mean, I'm out in daylight, not sunlight. You know, it was overcast, but still, it's pretty bright out, and everything is out of focus except what I'm focused on. I saw this bird and was able to just snap to it, get right in, follow him. 
I'm focusing by hand, mind you. This is all, uh, there's no autofocus here, so uh, the fact that the depth of field is as thin as it is at this distance becomes less of a factor, but it, it's still relevant. You actually still have to touch it up. You can tell I'm not doing a perfect job, but I don't know. I couldn't do that with a, with a DSLR or a handheld camcorder at all. This final shot was taken at night. Um, the sun was completely down. Uh, I was in downtown Seattle shooting off the top of the Guitar Center uh, out at Westlake. And as you can see, there's not much to look at. I was really surprised at how poor a job this did actually in this lighting. Um, I had the amplifier on all the way to 18 decibels. And with my naked eye, I could see quite clearly out here with the, the street lights and everything. Uh, and with my cell phone, I could also see very clearly. Now I know technology's changed, but I, I still anticipate this thing would do better than it did. Now right here you can see a phenomenon that's common to video tube cameras, which I'll explain a little bit better in a later video. It has to do with hysteresis of the sensing surface. But because it was so dark outside and I had the amplifier all the way up, uh, whenever I look at bright lights it leaves these trails behind. And I spent quite a while grooving on that. As you can see it's a pretty neat trippy effect. Uh, this is a thing I think was kind of popular in like 70s, 80s music videos back when all cameras uh, had this phenomenon. Uh, and of course went out of style. It's a lot harder to make with digital effects now. Very difficult, in fact, to get something that looks quite like this. But doing it through analog means is absolutely trivial. You just have to have something that's bad. At this point, I'm sure you've noticed the flickering green lines. I believe this is when the thing started to die. I think the components were starting to give out at this point. Maybe that's why the sensitivity is so poor. Although I'm guessing it was like this when it was new and that the amplification mode was only for shooting at dusk and shooting at night was never really a possibility. Here's another example showing you what poor low light performance it has. Uh, there's the shot from my cell phone and you can see it's pretty dang well lit out there. Uh, then the JVC just can't really get anything out of it. I did get a couple neat shots of flipping the doubler on which looks fantastic under this high contrast low lighting. It's really a transition I can imagine getting used in some current prestige television show, frankly. And that's the last of the footage I was able to get with this thing before I brought it home, and then it never really worked again. Here you can see an example of what the footage looks like now when the thing's misbehaving. You can see the heavy blue cast, the green bar's gotten larger, there's flickers and glitches all over the place. This is from a video when I was attempting to recalibrate the device, and I was able to make a few changes to it, but you'll see in a moment it doesn't get enough better to really be properly usable again. You can see here I'm uh, adjusting the settings to try and bring down that blue level, but all I can really seem to do is make the red level go way out of whack, or the green level go way out of whack. You can see here as well that the uh, horizontal scan lines from the tubes are highly visible, and I'm not sure what the cause of that is, but Whenever this thing is acting up like this, they start really showing up like that. It's almost a neat effect, except I can't control it, just like the glitches. I can't turn it on and off on command, so it makes it kind of difficult to use for anything practical. The best thing I could do with this thing at this point is just use it to shoot vaporwave videos in downtown Seattle, which, honestly, at this point, maybe I'll just do that. So that's everything I can show you about this guy. Uh, despite the sad ending, I hope you had a good time watching. Keep an eye out for more videos from me on other terrible old camcorders that I've collected and I'm filling my house with. And otherwise, thanks for watching.